Isaiah chapter 40, we are going to preach on a, a very familiar passage of Scripture. We're going to teach through it tonight. If you have your handbook for discipleship, it is chapter 14. Growing spiritually by learning to pray. We're going to hit different kind of components of prayer. But tonight I hope that you'll listen because I think that this is a precious message that comes from Isaiah chapter 40. It's one that challenged me as I prepared it for us tonight. And I think it's something that we can learn from tremendously. If you were going to tell me right now, this has nothing by the, uh, to do with the sermon, but as I look around to you, on a scale of 1 to 10, how are you doing spiritually walking with the Lord right now? How many of you would say, okay, we can do this fast so nobody remembers. How many of you would say on a scale of 1 to 10, I am a 1 to a 3 right now? 10 being the best, 1 being, how do they say it in the hospital? Don't you just love that in the hospital? You know, you're there because, you know, you have to be. On a scale of 1 to 10, how's your pain? Oh, it's just 1. How you doing? You know, it's pretty rough. All right, on a scale of 1 to 10, how are you doing spiritually? 1 is being very poorly, and 10 is being very, very good walking with you, as far as walking with the Lord in faith, trusting Him, these kind of things, doing really good. Okay, so how many of you would say, I'm a 1 to 3? I'm a 1 to 3 right now. Okay, put your hands down. That's really good. How about uh, four? That's not really good, but, you know, at least you're honest. Uh, four to, I'm a four to a six. I'm a four to a six right now. Probably about a four to a six right now. All right. How many of you say, I'm, I'm seven or above right now spiritually? I feel like I'm, my walk with the Lord is doing great right now. Amen. You know, we just need to pray for all the hands. We need to encourage each other in the Lord. Truth is that none of us, none of us always hang around nines and tens, you know. You know, sometimes the Lord allows us to be in the valley and we get very low spiritually so that we can greatly depend on him. How many of you know the little chorus? I forget what it's called, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord. How many of you know that one? Okay, will you sing it with me as we begin here tonight? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, how to wait. Stand, please, as we read Isaiah 21, 40, excuse me, chapter 40, verse number 21. This song comes right from this passage. Hath you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Clear back there. Man, this was written at least 700, my margin says, before Christ, way before science had said that the earth was a sphere. He sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the, the, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble, to whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? That, of course, is God Almighty. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall fail, uh, faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
hence the little chorus. You may be seated. The message tonight is on prayer, and for the next couple of weeks, we'll see different passages on prayer, but specifically about waiting on the Lord in prayer. Now, for a lot of my Christian life, that was a little bit of a mystery to me because I, I really didn't think it through. I don't think it's hard to understand, but I just really didn't consider the concept of what it means to wait on the Lord in prayer. The message is about the foundational reasons for why to wait on the Lord in prayer. And that answer is found right here in this passage. Can you see it? If you were to look logically through the verses that I just read, what would you say is, this is a group effort here, okay? I need to hear everyone. And I need to hear men as well as ladies. Ladies always volunteer first, okay? I need to hear men. Then the men feel bad and they raise their hands too. Can you see here uh, in this passage the why? Why you should wait on the Lord in prayer. Uh, what, what, verse 31 talks about the results of waiting on the Lord in prayer. But in the whole passage, there's an overall logic or reason given why we should wait on the Lord in our life when we need Him, when we're faint, when we're weary, we're falling. What is that overall reason that leads us to wait on Him? What is it? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, what else do you see? Yes. Okay, God's in control. Okay, what else do you see? If you were to say, what is the overall reason given here for why we should wait on the Lord in prayer when we're weary, when we're fainting, when we're falling, when we're failing, and we don't have the answer? Why should we? Because why? What's that in the back? I see your, come on, Linda, what are you saying? Okay, because he gives us strength. Okay, that, that's on the right track, but there's a step before that. Yes. He is all powerful. He is creator. Yes. He is the only one that can help. Okay, now we're on the right track. I think if you were to see the argument of this passage, the overall, all over log, the overall logic of why, why you shouldn't rush into your decisions, of why you shouldn't rush, rush into trying to work everything out in your life, working uh, everything from decisions to finances to trying to uh, steer your life the way you think it should go, what makes sense logically. I think the overall reason is to understand that He is all-powerful, that He is in total control of everything, that He is all the strength that you'll ever need, that his understanding far passes yours, and beyond all that, you add all that up together, and you see this, he is willing to give that power to you. He says it, this, it says it straight out. The Lord is willing to give that. Look at verse 29. He giveth power to the faint. So the best reason for you not to plunge into the directions of your life and plunge into the decisions of your life and plunge into the next day without waiting on the Lord to guide you without waiting on the Lord to do it, without waiting on the Lord to bring you to where you should be, probably the best reason is that He is all-powerful and He's willing to give that power to you so that you make those decisions, so that you're able to accomplish what He has called you to do. He is all-powerful. He has no equal. He rules over all the verses say. He is unsearchable in His understanding. And He is willing to give that power to those that wait and depend on Him. There's no such promise to those that like fools rush in, where angels fear to tread. You remember, you remember that saying? All right? To those that are foolhardy, there is no promise that the power that we see from God in this passage will be given to them to accomplish their life decisions. But there is a promise, a great promise, that you and I can receive power from the Lord in times of need through prayer when we wait on Him. What does it mean to wait? To wait. That's the amazing prayer promise. But what does it mean to wait? To wait. In verse number 31, look what it says. But they that wait. Here's the hinge. Here is the application. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And it goes on. What does it mean to wait? Prayer is more than just telling God what you need. I assume that everybody here prayed today. Did you, did you all pray today? Say amen. All right. If you didn't, just real quiet. Yes. I assume we all prayed today. But prayer, listen. Getting God's power in prayer is more than just telling God your needs, than just laying it out there. It is practicing the faith of pausing to get the answer. Let me say that again. Prayer is more, or receiving power from prayer, is more than just laying your needs out to God, just telling Him what you want. 
It is pausing and waiting for him to do it. Do you think how often our prayer life works like this? Lord, please work this situation out for me. I don't know what to do. do and we get up from our knees and we go and we make some decision and we pull some trigger or we sign some contract or whatever and we don't wait on the answer. Over and over, the Lord uses this phrase in the scripture of waiting on him. If this isn't the only place, there's, there's many very popular passages. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. If you're to find what is waiting on the Lord, it is practicing the faith of pausing to wait for the answer from him. It may take hours, it may take days, it may take months, it may take years. You say, well, I'm not willing to wait for that. Well, you're not willing to get the right answer either. See, half the problem with our prayer life is that we are not willing to wait to get the answer back from God when he is ready to give the answer. The idea is to tell God your need and to remain dependent on him. There's another great word for waiting. Waiting on him to work it out is the opposite of trying to work out your prayer requests all by yourself. Every one of us here are mature. Some of us have great life experience. Some of us are just getting that life experience now. We have kind of in our minds what should happen in order for us to get what we want. That is not right. That, that lets out the whole will of God. And it says, I can do it. Waiting is trusting in faith. That he wants to and he will engage in your answer. He doesn't want you to give your answer. We say, how do you know that? Well, I know somebody's favorite verse on here. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine what, Jack? Lean not unto... It's a command that you do not trust your own logic for making decisions of your life. Now, some of you are very brilliant in here. Some of you can, you know, you, 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 you feel like you can trust yourself. You're the most dangerous person in here. <laughs> you really are, because you have the answer. The Lord says, wait on me, I'll give you the answer. And a lot of times it's not what your answer is. One reason that we don't see the answers to our prayers is that we jump ahead of God. We are afraid to do just nothing and to wait on him. Let me say that again. One of the reasons we don't get answers to our prayer requests is because we don't wait on the Lord. We're afraid to do nothing and just wait on Him to make it clear. I'm not very old, but I'm mature enough in the Lord to know that when He answers, you know it. And then it's, you know it's the right thing to do. How do you explain like I do not know how, what, how to explain that. But those of you who have walked with the Lord long enough, you know that when you're waiting on Him and the answer comes, you know it's the answer and it's the right thing to do. And a lot of times it defies what the, what the common thing is to do. And a lot of times it even defies what somebody else wise has told you to do. Because it's not that, yes, you're supposed to listen. We're supposed to listen to counsel. But God's waiting on the Lord and God's answer trumps counsel. It does. Isaiah 40. Verse 31 promises that those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Now, this word appears here in a strong way. No pun intended. When we do things in our own fleshly strength, notice what the verse says. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their... Let me back up one verse. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Look up here. You know what that tells me? Look. It tells me that it's not in personal drive or in youth, or the fact that you're a dynamic person, or the fact that you're a type A person, or the fact that you're a disciplined person, that is the answer to what you need to guide your life. That it's not even the, he, he, he discounts all that. Hey, listen, even the young men, these strong young men, they're going to fail. They're going to fall. They're going to faint. You're not strong enough. You're not wise enough. You're not sharp enough to do in your life what's the right thing to do. But, verse 31, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When we do things in our own fleshly strength, like verse number 30, we may be giving effort, do you think about this, to the wrong time.